So while we're talking about individuals who um, maybe are dealing with some kind of hormonal suppression, whether that be perimenopause and ovulation, um, individuals who've kind of gone the route of TRT, you know, they've made the jump, they've decided, okay, like this makes sense for me. Um, I'm going to have actual TRT in place. I'm not going to go the precursor route of something like DHEA. Let's say they do start that first dose. What does it look like in terms of timing um, to establish that dosage and to understand really what it's doing for the individual? Well, I'll say what I've seen countless times is individuals are put on a dose. They're asked to come back um, anywhere from two to four to eight weeks to even upwards of three months. The individual is told to message in. Um, or to call in if they start to experience any kind of adverse effects, any kind of facial hair growth, any kind of excessive acne or other changes, which frankly, I have yet to have a provider explain that like at super physiological doses, if the dose is too high, you can experience things like vocal deepening, um, like the actual pitch of your voice can drop, um, clitoral megaly. Those are things that I would say I feel like secondhand what I'm hearing for cli from clients who've met with providers while well under my care have been like, yeah, that that's never been a part of the conversation, um, specifically starting TRT. So oftentimes what they're told is to report those unwanted effects or effects that are, you know, kind of out of the ordinary for them. Um, come back, maybe they'll retest levels, maybe they won't. Oftentimes I've heard people have just gone to see their provider after starting TRT and it's just been a discussion. There's been no labs drawn. It's been more of a consideration of, do you feel better? When you came to me initially, you felt like this, you were experiencing these negative symptoms, these unwanted um, symptoms of, of your current hormonal state, um, have they improved? And this kind of tracks back to what I was saying before, when we're talking about quantitative versus qualitative data. It's important to pay attention to symptomology and it's important to get a sense of where that individual feels best. But I think in the case of something like testosterone that can be highly virilizing to women, we have to really rely on that objective data in terms of adjusting the dose and making sure that we're not creeping up into that super physiological level, which it's not like... 101 or 110 nanograms for deciliter, it's not like, okay, things are going to change dramatically. Um, to be honest, I've had individuals who've been at 200, 300, 400 nanograms per deciliter for several months. They have noticed very minimal changes. Um, they have, in some cases, they haven't seen any changes. And once they've come to me, it's been like, oh, hey, like you shouldn't sit here indefinitely, um, even though you might feel good here compared to 100 or even 80 nanograms per deciliter or even 50 nanograms per deciliter. Um, realistically, if you're going to be on this drug for an extended duration for the rest of your life in a lot of cases, we just have to consider that the longer that you're in this super physiological territory, the greater likelihood that there is that things will change um, in, in a very irreversible sense. Now, this in it itself is the big reason that I would rather someone start on a form of TRT that is easy to measure in blood work. So yes, you have forms like the pellet, you have creams, you have gels, you have patches. I think even now there are intranasal options. I'm going to say just my understanding around pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, Going with injectable TRT is going to be a route that, yes, it, it very well might be uncomfortable for some people who are very sensitive to needles and very afraid of needles, um, but this is going to be the one that delivers the most consistent results and is the easiest to measure in lab work as well as titrate and adjust the dose if, let's say, that dose is too high for that individual. And let me just be clear because I had a call this week with a girl who had tried the pellet before, was not a fan of it. The provider came back to her and was like, hey, we can either do the pellet or an injection, but if you do the injection, you have to come into the office. That's going to be a higher fee. It's another cost that they can kind of tack on. Um, but alternatively, if you want to do it yourself and you don't want to do the injections, you can take this cream home and apply it directly, which you have to understand when we're talking about injections for TRT, specifically for female dosing, female dosing is much less than male dosing. We're talking about three and a half 
five milligrams, seven and a half, maybe 10 milligrams for some people every week. That's not every day. And especially if we're talking about pulling up from a bottle, even a bottle that's like 10 milligrams per ml, which is what I would recommend. Lower concentration is going to allow you to do more frequent injections. This is still such little volume, like it's next to nothing. And realistically, yeah, if it was an intramuscular injection, that would be very traumatic to the skin. Uh, I've done intramuscular injections. They're not fun. I don't prefer them, especially for individuals who are low body fat. Um, this can be, you know, potentially problematic and just frankly a turnoff to that method of administration. But in this case, when we're talking about a subcutaneous injection, I mean, this is very much something that um, it doesn't take a high skill level to do. Um, you can do it relatively safely. It actually does have a lower risk of infection rate compared to intramuscular injections. And realistically, when we're talking about uh, a drug that has such a narrow therapeutic index, we do have to be mindful that we need a form of administration. We need a method that let's say the levels do come back and they're too high. We can change those pretty easily. So yes, while for individuals who are afraid of needles, um, they, they don't necessarily have to go that route. There are alternatives. The concern that really I have when it comes to creams, gels, patches is that I don't find them as easy to titrate the dose. Um, the pharmacokinetics, like how the drug is actually metabolized is going to vary. And yes, I mean, to some degree based on the individual and the phase that they're in, but even when we look at absorption rates, they're not going to translate as directly as an injection would. And when it comes to ease, I really do think a subcutaneous injection is pretty reasonable for many people. Now, when we're talking about someone who has now started TRT, uh, we have established a dose and we're wanting to see where does this take them to. I mean, I kind of already covered that, like, I don't think we should be blindly going off the subjective data because I'll tell you, I've had lots of individuals come back with levels in the two, 300 nanogram per deciliter range, um, not by my doing, but being on a dose that um, equated to taking them to super physiological territory, um, not what I would recommend. And realistically, they've all felt incredible. They felt amazing. Their libido has been through the roof. Their training performance has gone up. A lot of them have seen, has, they've experienced compositional changes because they built muscle. And while I can understand the appeal to this and why this fares really well for providers who just go off the subjective data, we also have to consider that if this individual were to stop checking in, um, like in my case with me, or if they were to stop checking in with the provider, what is the likelihood that when staying at this dose, that it would potentially pose harm to them and not even just systemically, like from a hematology standpoint, but realistically, would it cause them to develop androgenic effects and traits? And that is the thing that we kind of have to battle. So simply going off subjective feedback improvements in overall well-being, like I'll tell you, it feels good. Yes, it feels good to have anabolics in place. Um, and if I could sit higher without the potential risk, you know, I definitely would consider it. But realistically, there's a threshold for a reason. We know that there is a relative range in which androgenicity is more than likely to occur. And it won't happen overnight. Um, overall androgenic effects, that is something that we can equate to total exposure over your lifetime. So in the case that someone maybe is at 150 nanograms per deciliter or 200 nanograms per deciliter as a female who's not wanting to transition, sure, maybe the first year they don't experience any changes. Maybe the second year, maybe they start to notice something adjusting. Maybe that's vocal pitch. Maybe that's swelling of the clitoris. But realistically, if that person is, I mean, if they're really lucky, they don't experience any kind of changes for a long period of time, but eventually that's going to run its course. And that's kind of the framework that I would prefer to work in. And I, I feel comfortable working in with clients who are on TRT, who are, are trying to essentially just take their levels back to normal to maybe even normal high, which that range that I would say, like we really shouldn't push past is 100 nanograms per deciliter. So when we look at ensuring clients are staying under that, that's where it's incredibly important that we're looking at levels anywhere from four to six weeks after beginning TRT, after starting the drug. And realistically, in the case that someone is 
injecting and they're doing injections multiple times a week. What I would like to see is that they inject, let's say they inject on a Monday, Monday morning, they go and get their labs Tuesday. So 24 hours after so that we can establish that peak level. So a lot of providers, what I've come, uh, what I've been met with is that they will look at the trough. And when I've asked clients, I'm like, okay, what was the thought process with the trough and not the peak? Or, or did was there a specification on like when you should get labs done? Sadly, in a lot of cases, there's no specification. It's really just up to the client's earliest convenience. Um, in some cases, providers have told them like, hey, we want to look at uh, where you are at the low end, because if that's too low, we don't want you to dip back into suppression or in the case where you're experiencing those symptoms that led you to seek help in the first place. Um, I think this is a huge, huge misstep um, on like medical care on on the provider's part, just because realistically, yes, like we don't want clients to begin to regress and to feel like they did um, prior to beginning TRT. But at the same time, not at the cost of just blindly hoping that that peak level is still within range. And frankly, in a lot of cases, when I've asked clients, like, what did your provider say you were going for? Like, what was the range that you wanted to hit with this dose? There isn't an established expectation. It's just a matter of we're going to put in 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and we're going to see how you do. And then from there, you're going to tell me if anything feels off or feels weird or if it feels too intense, and then we can go down. At this point, those of you who are familiar with my content, you've heard me say this a thousand times, it is a lot easier to titrate up than it is down. When we're talking about levels in a super physiological range, we're talking about levels in the two, 300, four, 500, which I, I've had clients who they've just insisted, I want to sit here. Yet they realize now that their levels could result in them developing male characteristics. So in turn, the only option that we have is to crash their levels, which means removing the drug entirely until we establish something that's a little bit closer to a biological females, natural to normal, normal high range. 